I came up here to uh, introduce Dr. Shalali, who really needs no introduction, but I wanted to say a, a couple of three words about him. And in Texas, a couple or three means a whole lot. Uh, one thing that has really blessed me about uh, Dr. Shalali, I, I, I've said this to many, many people, I've never gone to a meeting, and by the way, I, I, I'm privileged to serve as a trustee on his board, and I've never gone to a meeting where I didn't learn something. I just never, and I, I've always been so amazed uh, with just, just uh, who he is as a person. Of course, he's with his wife, uh, Deanne, uh, and I'm sure that she is a greatly responsible for all of his prowess, uh, you know. So uh, I'm certain about that. Uh, he has pastored several congregations, a, a very, very clear uh, speaker, um, very, very clear, uh, just a, a, very, a man who believes in education, and he is president of Stark College and Seminary. Actually, he brought that, uh, that college from basically, I'm going to say, from humble beginnings. I will say that uh, to be respectful. And, uh, and it's an accredited college. And I just recommend everybody, I always say to young people, you should go to Stark. You should go to Stark. Go to Stark College, you know, because you'll get a great education. Well, not only are those things true of him, but he is just a great human being. And uh, we really appreciate you, and we're always uh, honored when you would say when you say yes to come and share this pulpit. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Salel a hand. Thank you, Pastor. Short, 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 short. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. I asked him not to introduce me because really I'm just supposed to be invisible up here as we get to God's word this morning. So if you will allow me to be invisible this morning, will you let me do that so that all you see is Jesus Christ and my voice is just his voice this morning for us. That is my goal this morning. What a beautiful privilege we have to be in this house of the Lord on this day of celebrating not only a pastor's Appreciation Month, but also 36 years of ministry. What a tremendous blessing. Now, look, I'm the guy who's from, um, not a member of this church, but you guys know me, and I've known so many of you for so long. I want to go ahead and put in a personal pitch for how you can celebrate our pastors, Pastor Donna, and Sister Marva. Now, I know that there's lots of things you can do. You could write a note. And what pastor doesn't like a very kind, generous note about how they have blessed your life in some specific way? By the way, they have blessed you in specific ways, so why don't you go ahead and say specifically how they have blessed you when you write that note. Some of you, maybe you don't want to write a whole letter or note, you just want to send a card. That's totally appropriate. They would love that. Fill their mailboxes with cards this next several weeks. And in that card, write how much you love them and how much they have meant to you. And again, how they have blessed you. But could I be so forward and bold to kind of offer another way that which you could bless them? Look, it's not complicated. <laughs> On that letter or in that letter that you send or in that card that you mail to them, Stuff it with a little bit of green, a couple of gift cards, and something really, really special that you know they would love. Now look. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. There is no question that they have poured themselves out for you. The Bible says... Not many of us should be preachers and teachers because we're going to be held to a higher standard. That was a half-brother of Jesus. James said that. Many of you ought not to do that because you'll be held to that higher standard. I promise you, when we stand before our Heavenly Father, us, we're going to be held account for what we have done. But these, dear brother, this brother and sister, are going to be held account for how you have flourished. That's heavy. That's heavy. So make sure you bless them this month. Would you do that favor for me? Thank you. My assignment today is to bring God's word to you, a people who are celebrating 36 years of 
faithfully following Christ. You know, in, in modern day times, in modern day terms, that's a long time. Let me take, give you some really bad statistics. The average new church lasts five years. And new church pastors last 36 months. So 36 years is a big deal. Three decades of preaching and teaching and baptizing and marrying and burying and recognizing God's handiwork in you and in this city. Now, friends, that is commemorable. In addition to the pastors, Don and Marva, has anybody else, by raise of hand, been here also those 36 years? I know we have some right up here. Who else? Oh, my goodness. Look there. Wow. What a great testimony of commitment and perseverance. And yes, it takes perseverance to stay any place that long. Let's just call it like it is. Sorry, Pastor, if I'm being a little bit too uh, familiar with everybody. You guys, you, you let me be like this? Is that okay? I can't do this at all those other churches I preach in, but at the fellowship, I can do this. While praying over what I was supposed to speak about this morning at the fellowship, I began to ponder what's next for this church. Are the best days behind us or are they in front of us? Of course, of course, immediately we know instinctively that we're supposed to say that they are in front of us. So without diminishing the past, which we know has been profound, Let's consider the future Amen. of the church. A little bit of a rhetorical question. That's a question that you don't have to answer out loud. You can if you would like, but you don't have to. So what do you want the fellowship to be known for? In other words, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind in this city of Corpus Christi? And of course now in Kingsville and around the continent. So asking these kinds of questions for the 21st century reminds me of a church that was founded in the first century. You know, it was birthed by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey, and it was the church at Thessalonica. There, that church offers some helpful strategies in what I would say are faithfulness. And so today, on our 36th church anniversary, I want to explore three signs of a faithful church. Now, as was the custom... In both the Old and the New Testament, whenever God's people gathered together and the reading of God's word was proclaimed in their midst, God's people stood. And so I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the whole chapter, 10 verses. I invite those of you to stand with me and follow along as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And it says thus. From Saul and Savanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We thank God always for all of you as we mention you constantly in our prayers. Because we recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work of faith, your labor of love and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. We know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. In that our gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. Surely you recall the character we displayed when we came among you to help you? And you became imitators to us and of the Lord when you received the message with joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, despite great affliction. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For from you, the message of the Lord has echoed forth, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place reports of your faith in God have spread. So that we do not need to say anything. For people everywhere report how you welcomed us and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, our deliverer from the coming wrath. This morning, 
Our prayer is that we can see the signs of a faithful church. Father God, I pray now that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a spirit to obey. We pray this in the name, the only name that counts, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may take a seat. Now, Pastor gave a pretty difficult introduction to me today by saying that every time he hears me speak, he learns something new that puts a little bit of pressure on me to somehow perform and come up with something he's never heard before. (laughs) Pastor, you know that like the new things that we hear are generally heresy. (laughs) So I'm not going to try to to develop a new theology today. I'm going to stick with the basics of the Bible. And if you happen to learn a few things, great. But more than anything else, I pray that your heart will be motivated to apply the things that the scripture teaches. Now, you see, it was in Paul's day that Thessalonica was a bustling center of commerce and paganism. See, villages in the region date back before the Greek Empire. It was in 315 B.C. that the Macedonian king Cassander moved a large population into the city there of Thessalonica, and he named it for his wife. Her name was Thessalonica. She was the daughter of Philip II and the stepsister of Alexander the Great. This was a significant city that we oftentimes just pass right by as we read the scripture. From this point forward, the city grew to become one of the most strategic locations in the region of Macedonia. You see, Thessalonica became a naval center for both Greece and Rome. Now, hang with me, friends. This is not a history lesson. I'm not going to ask a pop quiz as you leave today, the service, nor am I trying to play to your pastor and teach him something he's never learned. There's a point here. Please stay with me, friends. This great naval center became a harbor for one of the finest navies in the region. The Romans made it the seat for their governor. And in time, it became the largest city in its region. You see, the city was on a Roman road, the Via Ingadia. And that road was a major trade route over the whole area of Macedonia. Now, lest we forget the challenges that were facing the early Christians, it was the Greeks in Thessalonica that claimed that Hercules founded their city, and they worshipped a false god named Jupiter, his father. You see, they built this large amphitheater where gladiatorial contests and public games were staged. Now, despite being known for its devotion to emperor worship, Thessalonica was this large community, had this large community of Jews. You see, it was the diaspora that spread the Jews around. Now, during Paul's second missionary journey, he made certain to stop there, of course, because it was a magnificent city. But he had just come from prison. He had been imprisoned in Philippi. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they traveled along this Roman road to this city. And there, probably around A.D. 50 in December, Paul and his entourage shows up there in Thessalonica, where they stay for several weeks and preach, and possibly a few more months. Now, clearly, influenced by Greek culture, Thessalonica was a Roman stronghold, which makes it a unique situation and a unique city because there was a Jewish synagogue there. Did you know what it meant to have a Jewish synagogue? You had to have at least 10 Jewish family or 10 Jewish men in a city. Not all of the cities along that road had a synagogue. And guess what? God used that particular moment for that particular servant to stop by in that particular pagan city and there preach the perfect gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the fulfillment of the messianic promise that God-fearing Jews were seeking to that day. Now, let's be clear about something right here from the beginning. Paul's message was not widely accepted among his Jewish tribes. 
And the Romans, they didn't care for it much either. According to the Roman history, followers of the way, or what we would call today as modern-day Christians, were despised throughout the empire. In ancient Rome, in the ancient Roman setting where Christianity was birthed, Christianity was perceived by many as being irreligious and impious and unacceptable threat to the social order. You're scratching your head. Wait a minute. The early Christians were thought to be irreligious and impious? Absolutely they were. The Romans referred to the Christians as different and odd and objectionable. Wow, what a label. It was the Roman historian Tacitus writing in the second century. He refers to the Christians as hated for their abominations and promoting a deadly and dangerous superstition. The the Roman historian Pliny the Younger wrote in a report to Emperor Trajan claiming that Christianity was having a negative effect on the economy surrounding all of the traditional deities. You see, basically, early Christians were considered atheists because they did not worship the pantheon of deities of their day. They only worshipped Jesus. The early Christians did not support the cultural norms and they rejected the Roman value system. Now, of course, any reasonable person would want to know what was it that the Christians did that was so terrible, especially that it's only been less than 36 years where Christians had been readily identified in Rome. Now, not only were they readily identified, but also their faith was growing so rapidly, causing great concern that by 40 AD, scholars believed that there had been, would be 1,000 followers of Christ in such a short time. 60 years later, seven to 10,000. In the next 100 years, 200,000 followers of Jesus Christ. And by the year, that's right, and by the year 300 AD, perhaps five to six million followers of Jesus. That is the power of one man stopping on the side of the road to preach in a synagogue the message of Jesus Christ. Do you want to know what it means to be faithful, friends? Stopping to say the name of Jesus. We should ask, What made these early Christians so identifiable? What made them so appealing? And what made them so despised? The Bible gives us the answer. Luke, in describing and possibly defending Paul in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, it says this, these men turned the world upside down. You see, the context of Luke's account is when Paul started this church in Thessalonica. I told you I was going somewhere, friends. <laughs> this church turned the world upside down. This pluralistic, this paganistic city in the Roman Empire. You see, the earth shattering behaviors of the Christians is well documented. Again, according to Pliny's report to Emperor Trajan, Pliny tortured two women about their religious beliefs, about their religious behaviors. And do you know what he found out? Get this, they met early on a fixed day of the week and they chanted a hymn to Christ as God. And they took an oath committing themselves to upright behavior. Wow, that's what two tortured women told him. It's Paul's call to holiness that sets the early Christians apart from the Roman culture. I highly encourage you to grab Larry Hurtado's book entitled Destroyer of the Gods and Early Christian Distinctives in the Roman World. Friends, what was happening in the first century is happening now in the 21st century. And here, Larry Hurtado identifies several uncommon traits that were turning the world upside down. Do you know what those five traits were? The early followers of Christ were peacemakers. In other words, they... promoted civility, and they were the first to forgive. They were pro-life. Infant abandonment was, it was terrible. It was horrendous. And it was the early Christians who went and grabbed those little infants from the trash heaps. And also the early Christians fought against all of the gladiator games where people were killed. They were pro-life. 
They were committed to monogamy. They had this sexual purity that they would stay within the confines of their marriage. That was antithetical to the Roman way. And they had justice for the poor and the marginalized. It was only in the Christian scriptures where we have women, children, and slaves dignified by even being mentioned in the sacred writings of our faith. One of the other distinctives of these early Christians where they were committed to racial diversity. See, in that day and time, you were supposed to be segregated and separated by your class, by your race, by your ethnicity, by your religious perspectives. But it was only among the early Christians where all God's people came together under the banner of Christ. They didn't put aside their ethnicity and their culture and their traditions, but they elevated Jesus. And that's what made them stink. Friends, my fear is that we as Christians in the 21st century have lost some of our distinctiveness. We've allowed the world, the secular world, to rob us from what we were originally called to be and to do. So with this understanding of the Roman culture and history of, the, of Thessalonica, let's talk a little bit about the faithfulness of this early church. You see, Paul, as was his custom... What did he do? But he went into the new city and going to the synagogue, he then began to preach or reason with them. Scripture says that he went there for three successive Sabbaths, seeking to convince his hearers that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But as Jesus promised, opposition soon sprung up. And their ministry took on a a substantive significance as the Jewish authorities in Thessalonica became jealous of Paul's popularity. The jealous Jews is what I like to call them. You want to go and you read more about this. Your homework for today, no pop quiz required, is Luke, Luke, read Acts chapter 17 where Luke records that some of the bad characters were round up in the marketplace and they started a riot. And dragging some of Paul's associates before this mob, they accused them of defying Caesar's decrees by proclaiming that Jesus was the king. I wonder at what point, pastors, are we going to, as Christians, have to make us claim that Jesus is our king above all the other kings that are clamoring for our attention. Ultimately, Paul had to leave Thessalonica for Berea and then for Athens due to these jealous Jews. So Paul sends Timothy. And in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, we get the report back of Timothy's report. And it gives us this report that Paul writes about the good things that are going on. The good news is that the church was thriving amidst all of its difficulty that it was encountering. Now, Paul takes the chance to encourage them in their faithfulness. So for those of you who are the note-taking type, I'm going to encourage you to write this down because the, one of the first signs that we see from this passage of Scripture that we know about the Thessalonians is that a faithful church serves Christ in the hard times. A faithful church serves Christ in the hard times. Despite the persecutions that Paul experienced in Thessalonica, the apostle began his letter in the most joyous manner. Read it there. We always thank God for you, mentioning you in our prayers. That is a good pastor right there. Always praying for his people. So why was Paul so thankful for them? I really like how the NIV translates this particular verse. He says, we continually remember before our God and Father, get this, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in verse 3. In other words, Paul describes the source of his thankfulness. Let's unpack this just a little bit. The first thing that he was thankful for was your work produced by faith. In all their deeds, the the Thessalonians were working because their faith in Jesus. They were expressing faith in all that they did. Not even their suffering were they were enduring was going to distract them. Friends, when we work based out of our faith, no one can stop us. It provides a transforming experience and motivation that nobody else can replicate. You can't bottle it. You can't sell it. You can't manufacture it. When your work is 
pushed by your faith, you are unstoppable servant of God. These people here in Thessalonica were unstoppable because of their faith. But Paul goes on and says, your labor is prompted by your love. It wasn't because they felt that they were entitled or they had some duty, but it was because of their love that they worked. It was literally translated your stressful work of love. Have you ever loved someone that it was a little bit stressful? Let me just go ahead and say it out loud, friends. If you've not loved someone that's caused you a little bit of stress, you're not loving them far enough, deep enough, wide enough, long enough. That's what agape love is. Now, there's some of us that are easy to love. And there's some of us that aren't so easy to love. Paul says their labor was prompted by their love. They were, they were fully committed to their love. Their endurance inspired by hope. Their faithfulness, willingness to stand at their post despite all opposition. Thus, the Thessalonians were motivated by faith, their love, and their hope. It's the highest attributes of the Christian life. This was one of the very first letters that Paul wrote, but by the time he gets to the letter to the Corinthians, he's kind of perfected his turn of phrase. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, he says, Now these three remain. And he puts them in a different order, but it's the same words. Faith, hope, and love. Say it with me. Faith, hope, and love. In the hardest times and places, God strengthens and uses his people to build his kingdom. And if we, if we as Christ followers, if we trust and love Jesus, placing our hope in his present salvation and his future reward, we are strengthened to work, to labor and endure for his glory, for his glory and for our good. I once read about the third largest cathedral in the world. It's in Seville, Spain. After 700 years of Muslim occupation, they were overthrown by Ferdinand III, and the Spanish Christians began converting this very large city mosque into a Christian cathedral. They changed its orientation. They expanded its halls. They took away the accoutrements of the Muslim faith, and they embodied what it meant to be a Christ church in a Christ cathedral. The mosque was said to take 10 years to build, but the cathedral took a hundred years to complete. It wasn't because they were slow, but because they were pouring their every bit of resources into it. It's even believed that Christopher Columbus is buried there in that cathedral. It is enormous. Now, I've never seen it in person, but I've read about it. And historians say that the workers inscribed on one of the walls on the interior this phrase. Let us build here a church so great that those who come after us will think us mad ever for having dreamed of it. Talk about a commitment of someone's faith to have that level of perseverance sometimes our best work friends comes on the heels of our hardest days you see a faithful church serves christ in hard times but secondly a faithful church suffers for christ in joy look at verse six paul reminds the thessalonians the standard of obedience in verse six you became imitators of us and of the lord in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. You see, in Paul's words, his word choice elicits an unforgettable image of suffering. It's the idea of this huge stone that crushes wheat into flour. We call it the millstone. You see, the Thessalonians followed Paul's example in suffering as they witnessed his own difficulties and his own setbacks. But they also imitated the Lord in his crucified obedience. The Easter story teaches that Jesus Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps, Peter tells in his book. To see, the Thessalonians now followed and they imitated Christ's example with the steadfast commitment to Christ. So what is it? So amazing is it how they received the message with joy. They received the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit, verse 6 says. 
This was not a dull, a drab, faith of obligation, but, but rather a vibrant, a joyful relationship with their father. Friends, we know joy is one of the fruit of the spirit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Joy is this deep sense of well-being that transcends our circumstances. Joy and happiness are not the same. We may be happy with the circumstance, may not be happy with the circumstances in hard times, but we can always be filled with the Spirit of God, which produces joy. You see, the pathway to joy is by choosing obedience, even in the hard times. Say that with me, choosing obedience in hard times. Choosing obedience in the hard times. We can always be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. Then it produces joy. The pathway to joy is by choosing obedience, even in the hard times, even in the hard places, because we experience the presence and power of God's Spirit. When God blesses us and controls us, He fills us with joy. Amen. A faithful church suffers for Christ in joy. The third sign of a faithful church is a faithful church shows Christ to the world. Amen. Look at verses 7 through 10. When we serve Jesus and we suffer for him with joy, others see and experience our faith. Paul's next statement in verse 7 is not surprising. He says, and so you became an example or a model of all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. This is like saying your reputation has preceded you all throughout the world and South Texas. You see, it was the Thessalonians, they led the way with their faithfulness. As a result, the Lord's message sounded forth from you in verse eight. That phrase sounded forth, I love this. It literally means to reverberate, to echo like a voice echoes in the hills or a bell echoes after it has been struck. You see, Paul says, the gospel rang out through their obedience so strongly and so loudly that their faith in God became known everywhere. Fellowship family, isn't that why we come together to let our faith reverberate and echo throughout not only this hall, but the halls of history, the halls across the world? Oftentimes our perseverance in trusting Jesus despite the difficulty we face for him is often our strongest witness to the community and the world. We don't like to hear that. So I'm going to repeat it one more time because I don't think some of you heard me. <laughs> Oftentimes, it is your perseverance in trusting Jesus despite the difficulties that you're having this week, Man. despite the layoffs, despite the economic downturn, despite the, the volatility of the stock market. It's our perseverance in trusting Jesus, despite all these things, becomes our strongest witness to the community and to the world. So let me ask you this question. What message is reverberating in your life these days? What message is reverberating in your life these days? Friends, whether the world recognizes or rewards your service to Christ... Heaven rejoices when we do what we can for the Lord that we love. As we serve God in hard times, suffering in the joy of the Spirit and showing Christ to the world, nothing we do for Jesus is wasted. Friends, nothing you do for Jesus is wasted. No tear you shed, no word you give, no prayer you offer is wasted for Jesus. Every act of obedience bears eternal significance. It's God's faithfulness and favor. They have certainly been on this church as we look backwards. But the question remains, what about going forward? Friends, if we are not careful, we're going to try to live on the blessings of the past and forget about the blessing of moving forward. Amen. Remember, God blesses his people. He has blessed this church so that we can be a blessing to others. And I believe the same is true for you here at this church. The time has ended where Christians were the favored majority of our culture. 
Today, our distinctiveness is not in the fact that we gather and sing songs, although that is immensely important. That happens in concerts and places all around the country. But maybe I, I, I ask you, maybe our distinctiveness goes beyond our gathering, but into our scattering God's blessings that are found only in Jesus Christ. Will you become a gathering, scattering congregation to this world? You see, the early church turned the world upside down because of Jesus' followers valued life and their upright living in ways that the secular culture did not. And so my invitation to you, friends, is to invite you to recapture the motivation of your past, but let it propel you into the future. And so I close with the question that I asked at the beginning of the sermon. What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? My prayer is that not only will this church reverberate with the truth and love of Jesus Christ, but that your individual life will stand out among the paganism of our day. May it be said of you, not just of the disciples in the New Testament, that as you live your life for Jesus, you are turning the world upside down for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fellowship family, 36 years is grand, but it's just the beginning. Amen. Let us dedicate our hearts, our lives, our minds, our future to lifting Jesus Christ everywhere we go. Being ready to give a word for the hope and for the faith that we have so that one, Maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, hundreds, thousands will come to know Christ because of the witness that we have here today. Let me invite you this morning to stand. I'm going to say a prayer. And as the Lord leads, if you need to do business with Jesus, this altar is open. There will be people here who can pray and talk with you. If you've been walking on the outside of life and it's time to get back on the inside, there's people here, pastors here, leaders here who will pray with you so that you can take that one step back. It may be 5,000 steps away, but it's just one step back to Jesus. Maybe your life hasn't been very filled with faithfulness over the, the past season. Brother or sister, please, you can come and get right with Jesus. Maybe you've come today as an invitation of a friend and this gospel of Jesus is still rather new to you. This church preaches Jesus and Jesus alone. You can come here and be told how Jesus can set you free. You've heard us sing about it, but we can, we can show and tell you how he can do it in your life. So after I pray, you come as the Holy Spirit leads. Father God, thank you for your goodness and for your grace. Thank you that you've called us to be distinct faithful, filled up followers with G of Jesus into this world. So God, I pray now that you would move among your people and do only what you can do. Call us to your face, to your place, to your name here at this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You come now as the Holy Spirit calls.